So we had the lunar eclipse uh, just late last week and I'm here in England and sadly we got clouded out. Uh, it was it's a fairly marginal event at dawn but the clouds uh, made it not happen. So today we're looking forward to the next eclipse which will be a partial solar eclipse that's coming up on the 29th of March. And that's going to be visible in uh, large parts of the northern hemisphere in Europe and the east coast of America and Canada and up into the Arctic. So in this video I'll just talk you through a little bit of the circumstances of the eclipse, look at a few locations and some of the interesting shots that can be planned and executed for this event. So let's start by looking at a little bit of the circumstances of this eclipse. It's happening on the 29th of March as I mentioned. Just a little bit on the geometry first of all. This is a, a little diagram showing the different types of eclipse. So the sun is out here off, off the slide and the moon is here, the, the shadow has been cast on the Earth, and it's formed of two parts similar to the lunar eclipse last week, the penumbra and the umbra. If you are standing in the penumbra, then you will see a partial eclipse. Uh, that is to say, part of the sun will appear to be blocked by the moon, but not all of it. If you're standing uh, in the umbra, then that's a total eclipse. Now in this event, there, there is no nowhere on earth that will see the umbra and that's because the geometry puts the umbra just missing off the top of the north pole somewhere up here and we only have part of the the penumbra that intersects with the surface of the earth let's have a look at that here this is a, a globe view and and these lines represent lines of equal magnitude of the eclipse and essentially what this here is, is the, the, the limit. So beyond, if you're south of this line, say you were down here in Mali, you would not see any eclipse at all. As you progress northwards and westwards, the eclipse magnitude increases and it reaches a maximum somewhere up here. We'll have a look in a moment where that is. Um, 61 degrees north, 77 degrees west. And it reaches a magnitude of 0.938. So that's to say roughly 94% um, magnitude uh, eclipse. The, um, this number here, this gamma number, uh, the gamma number essentially, if you see a positive gamma number, that's telling you that the, the point of greatest eclipse is lying, or the point of the umbra is lying north. And if it's more than one, it means it misses on the north side of the earth. If it's more than, if it's less than minus one, it misses on the uh, south side at the south pole. So that's roughly the, the, the map of this thing, and you can see the, the limits are sort of somewhere running through here on the, on the eastern uh, coast of North America. But it stretches off over here towards Russia and Svalbard and over Siberia, and covers a, a ton of, of Europe and Iceland and Greenland and so forth. How do these eclipses appear in photographs. Well, this is a, um, an eclipse from back in 2015, taken not far from where I am now, uh, in Northumberland in England. And in this case, the sun is 72% uh, obscured, and we're viewing the eclipse through the usual sort of low-lying, fairly fast-moving clouds that, that, we, that we see in this part of the world. And this, uh, this photograph was taken, I think, with uh, an ND grad filter, not, not an actual solar filter. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, separately, about whether or not you need um, a solar filter for this eclipse. You should assume that you do need a solar filter for the eclipse, and you should always be observing safely. We'll come on to that uh, separately. Here's another eclipse back in May 2012, taken in Boulder County, Colorado. Um, and this is very relevant for this upcoming eclipse. Eclipses do occur at sunrise and sunset. Sunrise and sunset often define the limits of the visibility of the eclipse. And this was an annular eclipse. I wasn't actually in the path of annularity. But you can see a partial eclipse with the sun setting over this ridge line here. I would say that the sun's probably at, I forget what it was, maybe five, four, four, four five degrees at this point, I'm guessing. And uh, you can see that sort of effect of a, a setting eclipsed sun. It's not actually at sunset, it's before sunset because I'm looking up towards this ridge. So let me show you how to find the eclipse and view the information about it in Photo Ephemeris web. I'm here at app.photoephemeris.com. It's 
currently set to the 17th of March, which is today's date, and I'm located here in uh, the northeast of England, around Newcastle upon Tyne. So I would recommend that you can come to the events list here and look under the Solar Eclipses tab. You can also find it under the 2025 tab. But here you'll see that gamma information that I showed before, the magnitude and the, the, the point of greatest eclipse. So if I select that one and do view, it's going to take us essentially to the right place. And so that is that location, 61 North 77 West. And you can see down here in the timeline, the point of max eclipse, the magnitude is 0.938. Here in the simulator, this is what the sun is going to look like in this location at that time. And so this is the, the most eclipsed version of the sun you're going to see for this particular event. Remember that um, if you uh, are using the simulator, remember to click this little expand button here. And essentially that will swap the simulator with the map. And you can, using I'm using two fingers on my trackpad here to zoom in and then clicking and dragging to pan. And you can play through the eclipse. I can go back, say, 10 seconds like that. And in fact, what we can do is watch what happens at sunrise. I'm just reversing through time. So you, you're seeing it in reverse, essentially. But let's just go back and, and play that through. I'm going to put it on at 100 times real speed, so it'll be a pretty quick, quick view. Here we go. There's the sun coming up, eclipsed. And you see how that rotates around? I've paused it there. This is 6.51 in the morning, so it's a sunrise eclipse up in northern Canada. And you may note that there's some sort of rather interesting effects that, that you get here. Um, particularly this, this wonderful crescent with two two horns, if you will, um, near sunrise. So one of, the, one of the great opportunities here photographically is to try to capture this thing at the point of sunrise. If we are, one of the nice things about the simulator here is you can pick up and drag and drop this map pin to wherever you want, um, and it will just update the simulator for you. So for example, if we come over here down south a bit, towards the coast, what might we get? I don't know what this location is. It's probably in the middle of nowhere, but uh, you can easily move this around and then we can just reverse the time a little bit. And here you can see that the eclipse is not happening at, at, sun, at sunrise at all. It's later. Um, that's a time zone difference as well. Let's go back to the map and just have a look at that. So here's sunrise at 6.55. The max eclipse doesn't occur till 8.02. So it's clear that to get the sunrise eclipse, you need to pick your location somewhat, somewhat carefully. If we come down to, say, the coast of northern Maine, I'm just picking a random spot. This is not necessarily an ideal spot. You can see here in the timeline, sunrise at 6.13, max eclipse at 6.17. So let's just click at max eclipse. And here again in the simulator, you can see this is pretty close to... Um, Sunrise, let me just expand that. And again, we'll just click back a few. Now that's, that's a pretty neat thing to observe. And don't forget that in addition to the two horns here, if you get clear skies, uh, what you will also see is some vertical compression of the sun due to refraction. I, it's essentially the bottom of the sun is lifted up uh, more than the, the the horns will be. So there'll be some fantastic um, effects that potentially can be photographed um, for, for this sunrise event. Now what happens if you're not in Canada? Let's have a look at some other locations and see what they might see. I'm going to come over the other side of the Atlantic. Let's go for example to uh, let's try Galway here. I'm just going to press the C button to recenter the pin somewhere around Galway. Zoom out a little bit here, and I'll go to the point of maximum eclipse. And you can see a couple of things. One is that the eclipse, as we've moved further east across the Atlantic, the eclipse is no longer occurring around the time of sunrise. It's happening later in the morning, mid-morning, with the sun and the moon more or less to the southeast here, and relatively higher in the sky, so 35, 36 degrees. 
and the magnitude of the eclipse, as you may expect, has reduced because we've moved away from the point of greatest eclipse. We've moved essentially southeast away from that. And so this is, this is the magnitude in this location. If we were to fly up to Iceland, let's have a look at what we get there. We'll come out here on the Snaffelsnes Peninsula. That's a bit of a tautology, Snaffelsnes. That means peninsula um, in Icelandic, I believe. But anyway, uh, out here we are. And again, the maximum eclipse is mid-morning, just a few minutes really later than it was in Ireland. But have a look here, the magnitude is somewhat greater, 74.8%. If we zoom out and just look at how to read these lines, remember these are lines of equal magnitude. So that's the limit. Below that line you won't see any eclipse at all. Outside these limits you won't see the eclipse. Um, and here we have, the, this one is the 0.8 magnitude limit line. So if I were to drop the pin just over on the coast of Greenland, we should see a maximum eclipse of just over 0.8, which is what we see. Coming back to, let's go back, for example, to somewhere in Scotland. Let's try that again. There we go. And I'll just zoom in so we'll sort of see where we are. Let's say we're out, out here um, on one of the islands. And... We're photographing the eclipse, again, mid-morning, about 0.5 magnitude. So one of the things that uh, you might do in, in these areas which don't have quite as much um, magnitude as, as, as over in Canada or in Iceland, for example, is that you, you in a partial eclipse, one of the things that's quite interesting to do is if you have a, a long lens and a solar filter, you can track the progress of any sunspots. This is, these are example sunspots, they're not the actual sunspots. And, but you can imagine that at some point these can become obscured by the moon and then on the other side of the eclipse they may become revealed again. And if you time things carefully you can get some nice photographs of, of sunspots being obscured and revealed close to the limb of the moon. And of course if you have a long enough lens and enough focal length, then your photograph at high resolution may reveal the uneven limb of the moon, the thing that causes Bailey's beads uh, during a total eclipse. One critical consideration for this eclipse, particularly for folks on the east coast of North America, is going to be the weather. So let's have a look at this location. Let's say we came to uh, Maine and we're out at Northeast Harbor here on the coast for the eclipse, you are going to want to look at what the cloud conditions will be, particularly this direction here um, to, the, to the east out of the, of the ocean. And uh, here you can use photo WX. Uh, I'm going to click the link and it will take us to the same location in photo WX. Now, today is the 17th of March. Uh, I don't have weather maps that go out that far yet. But in the days leading up to the eclipse, you may want to, to monitor the, the cloud conditions around the time of sunrise um, used in, in these locations. So this is now back at 8.01. Let's just go back a, a, a couple of minutes uh, to 7.12-ish. And you can see that if the, if the eclipse were happening this morning, we wouldn't be having a lot of luck seeing it. Um, this is the location on the coast here with pin is there's the direction to the sun and it'll be rising slightly further north in 12 days time. I'm looking here at the the North American mesoscale model NAM 5k and the multi-level cloud layer so if you recall if you've seen this before we have high medium and low level clouds in different colors and then potential pairings of high medium high low medium low and then the combination of high, medium, and low, which means essentially clouds predicted at every, every level in the forecast model, and that reduces to this gray color that you see here. So this is thick cloud, not, not looking great. Um, we can look at a different model, for example, HRRR. There's the HRRR model, looking very similar for the cloud forecast in this location here. 
this is the edge of the coverage uh, zone so you get a little bit of artifacting on these these extreme edges but they're not super useful around here anyway it's a bit too close to tell you what you necessarily going to be able to see uh, but they extend quite a long way north if i have a look at gfs there's another one again it's all pretty consistent this morning not a lot of joy with with the weather and finally let's look at ECMWF again similar not great one thing that you may wish to make use of uh, assuming there were a break in the clouds so for example if we came uh, up to, to St John I don't know there's there's hardly any breaks in the cloud here but I'll quickly show you how this would work um, I've moved up to St John uh, a little bit farther north there's not a lot in the way of clear skies as you can see in this forecast. I've also enabled this cloud observability layer and when that is on in conjunction with the sun it will show you uh, a these circles that say how far away can you see these clouds for so for example uh, low cloud we can see here low cloud we can see here this low cloud here is sort of too far away to be seen it's too low um, in the sky to make an appearance above the horizon to an observer located over here, for example. So for low cloud, we're only really worrying about these first two or three circles. For medium or high cloud, we'd be looking much further further out because they can be seen from much, much farther away and therefore they can block the sun from much farther away. Um, here, this particular line there, they see that little blue segment, that is saying that at this time in the morning, for this, when the sun is at this particular altitude, uh, any low cloud in this area is going to block the sun. So essentially, the sun would not be visible at this time. So then we'd be reliant on how thick are the clouds. Is the sun going to be visible through the clouds at all? And you can make a judgment on that based on the opacity of the, of the map. You can see here, there's, it's thinning out a little bit on the edge here. But it's getting thicker here and there's also some medium cloud getting in the mix this is the equivalent line for medium cloud this is the line for high cloud <clears throat> so at this time it looks like there is a little bit of high cloud around here potentially there's little hints of yellow and that also would be potentially blocking the sun at this time based on the forecast so i think for folks who are photographing this eclipse around sunrise it's particularly useful to uh, use this tool to look at the forecast, see what's coming up, and make a judgment as to whether you may want to adjust your location if there's somewhere looking a little bit more promising from a cloud perspective, uh, particularly if at the time of the eclipse or at the time of sunrise, uh, the clouds may be obstructing, obstructing the view.